Now, Craig asked me if I would share some reflections from my ministry, give some lessons from what I've learned, and to share my favorite parable. I was a dairy farmer, so my favorite parable would have to be an agricultural parable, because most of them are, as Jesus uh, taught. But this morning, I actually want to start by telling you a simple story from one of the first times I recognized one of the main callings that God has given me. I feel like that one of the main purposes that God has given me is to raise up young leaders and to mentor them. And actually, I saw this very early on, about a little over 50 years ago. When I was in high school, I actually, uh, this is my 45th year of ministry. Uh, I started in 1977 as a lay pastor. This is my 45th year. Uh, But before I was a pastor, I was, during high school and college, I taught the junior high Sunday school class at the Antietam First Church of God. Now, that's a church that I grew up in as I was teaching these young men and women. It was kind of exciting to see them open and listening. And there was one young man who was really, really good in that class, and he wanted to know all about God. Now, the church that I grew up in was a King James Version-only church. And, you know, I'm not here to criticize the King James Version or, or anything, but these junior high kids, they didn't totally understand the these and the thous and the... the the doeth and those kinds of things. And just as I was in high school, the Living Bible came out. And so this one young man who really was trying to understand and study and become a a really strong Christian and a leader was struggling a little bit with understanding the King James Version. I bought him a Living Bible and gave it to him. Well, his parents went to the church council and they said, do you know what your teacher for the junior high class is doing? He's bringing foreign stuff into the church. He's going against what your wishes are. And he's also teaching from the living Bible whenever he teaches. So I went before the church council and sort of got chastised pretty heavily by some of them. So that day after I was chastised and heading out from the meeting, the pastor came along and he came up to me and he says keep doing what you're doing which really helped me to understand and to be honest it's what I've been doing ever since it's something that I feel like God has called me to and something I feel like is important by the way a little footnote to that that young man eventually became a pastor and his parents came to me and apologized for being critical of me giving him a living Bible. But I learned early on that God's word is powerful. Reflection number one, there's power in the word of God. You know, one of my favorite passages of scripture, and to be honest, I actually preached from this passage a couple years ago down here at this church. Isaiah 55, 9 to 11. Here's what that scripture says. I, I love this passage. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Folks, there's a lot of power here. You know, I I loved what your video said about the feeding program and the service that happened down there. But do you know what really excites me about what you you guys have done there? You gave them 2,000 Bibles to hand out. There are people all over Honduras that have the Word of God and that power because of you. I, I know Craig patted on your back. I'm gonna pat you on the back too. That is wonderful what you're doing. I know you give out Bibles to people here locally too. The Word of God is so important. And the scripture we're looking at talks about the seed of the Word of God, which is where I, what I'm using that to introduce this. Now there's another scripture that I'm going to mention to you right now also. Um, Proverbs 22, 6, that actually goes along a little bit with the power in the Word of God. Here's what the scripture says. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not return, they will not turn from it. Now that goes along with Isaiah 55, but I think 
probably a, maybe even a little better translation of that might be this. Start children off in the way they should go, and even when they are old, it will not depart from them. You know, sometimes we, we get that passage and we think, wait, wait a second, my child's turning away from this. But let me tell you something. That scripture's always with them. And they'll remember what they heard and what it said. Now, let me give you an illustration of that. My mother is 94 years old. She's in an assisted living uh, facility. We go to visit her. We try to go visit her about every three weeks. She lives in Maryland. We were actually in to visit her two weeks ago. Now, my mother was really good until about three months ago. At the end of July, she had a stroke. And since she's had the stroke, she, her memory's not very good. Uh, she can't really put thoughts together very well. Uh, we were there two, three, well, we were there two weeks ago. And when we were there, as we went to visit her on, a, on the morning we were coming back home, my sister called me and said, one of mom's best friend's husband passed away last night. Two farms up from the farm I grew up on was a family named Hank and Rosalie Jamison, and they were probably my parents, one of their best friends, maybe even their best friends, and Rosalie was my mother's, I think probably my mother's best friend. And Rosalie's husband, Hank, died the morning before we were there, and so my sister said, would you please tell her and talk to her a little bit about that? So we did. So I talked to her about Hank passing away, and she was sad because of Hank passing away. And then I said, no, I understand that Rosalie was up to visit you two weeks ago. And my mother said, I don't really remember. And so then we, and to be honest, she can't really remember who was to visit her the day before. So then we were talking a little bit about that, and I said, okay, I know Hank grew up about a mile from you whenever you were growing up. And she started spouting off things about growing up, and what it was like whenever her and Hank were in school together. Told some stories from then. She could remember that with clarity. Folks, the things that children learn from God's word will not depart from them. There's so many times whenever somebody's in trouble and they'll come with me and they'll talk about some dumb decisions or dumb uh, things that they've done and they'll say, well, I still remember what my mother used to tell me. I still remember what my pastor used to tell me, or I still remember this scripture that impacted me whenever I was young. That word will not depart from them. When I talk to people about their children, a lot of times they'll tell me about, oh man, here's the sports they're involved with. Ah, they're involved with music in this way. Oh, here's the special interest they have. Sometimes they don't really mention, well, here's how they're involved in church. Here's what they're doing with Scripture. Here's how God is working in their life. Folks, make sure that you include God. God should impact the whole aspect of it. Don't leave God out of teaching of your children. Well, the Scripture, let's get into the, the parable. Uh, I love this parable, like I said. Uh, it's an agrarian parable, Matthew 13, 1 to 9. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, we'll be uh, talking a little bit through it. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 9, Jesus gives the parable, and then he goes to 18 to 23 and tells what the parable means. Well, let me read it to you. Matthew 13, 1 to 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it with all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So he told that parable, and not everybody got it. So a little bit later on, Jesus says, well, let me explain that to you. Here's what it means, starting in verse 18. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. 
When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky soil refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soul refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Like I said, I love the agrarian uh, parables, and, and most of them are because up until 120 years ago, in all societies, that was what almost everybody knew. They knew what it was like to plant crops. They knew what it was like to grow seed. They knew what it was like to raise animals. Up until the Industrial Revolution happened about the turn of the 19th, or the turn of the 20th century, uh, people understood. In fact, in a lot of countries around the world, in Honduras, I'm sure the agrarian parables mean a lot. I've been to Haiti about 10 or 12 times, and almost every time they ask me to preach in a church somewhere, and I almost always use one of the agrarian parables, and I actually, you know, the people are with me because they know exactly what it means because they live it. And this parable really, it has a lot of application, not just in the people who are farmers, but it has application into all of us. One of the th great things about it is that the reflection number two is every person is one of the four soils that Jesus mentioned in this parable. Every single person you come into contact will be one of these four soils. Some of them are the path. Some of them are the, the, um, the stony ground. Some of them are the ground with thorns, and some are the good ground. Every single one of them are going to be part of it. The reflection three that I love about this parable is this. God gives every person free will to decide for themselves what they will do with the Word of God. God gives every person free will to decide for themselves what they will do with the Word of God. He doesn't force anyone to make a decision. And everybody has free will. Now, Merriam-Webster, the dictionary, says this as a definition of free will. Free will says that persons have the power or capacity to make decisions or to take actions that are not determined by prior causes or divine intervention. Now, let me just... That's probably a little strong because we do know that prayer, Scripture, God's Word... The Holy Spirit does impact people, but God doesn't force anyone to follow him. Every person has a chance to have free will. Now, the reason why that's important is because sometimes we wonder, what is going on with people? Why are they not responding to the gospel? You know, I told you the story this morning to start with about the young man who became a pastor that I was able to mentor. I could have just as easily told you the story about a lot of the other people in the class who actually never responded very much at all to the gospel. Because every one of them is part of the four soils, and everyone has the chance for free will. Let me share with you how this impacts parents in many cases. A lot of times, and, and I talked about Proverbs 22, and some of you are probably saying, oh my goodness, my kids, I've taught them about Jesus Christ, and they've gone away from that. Folks, we can teach our kids the best we want, and they've got to make up their choice themselves. They have free will. Every single one of us will recognize families where there are children who were raised in the same environment, in the same church, the same teachings, and some follow Christ and some don't. When I sit with parents, a lot of times, parents struggle with guilt. They say, oh my goodness, my adult children, they're not following what I taught them. They're not following what we've shared with them in the church. And they feel guilty. And they say, what did we do wrong? Folks, God doesn't want us as parents to be 
be filled with guilt. Now, he wants us to do the best job that we can. He wants us to make sure that we tell them about the Word of God, that we show them the Word of God, that we live the Word of God. But every one of them has to make their own choices. We have three children. And I want to tell you, I'm proud of all three of them. Love all three of them. I would brag on my kids. If you come up and ask me, I'd tell you, here's how each one of them are changing the world. But not all of them are following Christ the way we want them to. Every single person has to make their own choice. Do your best as a parent, but recognize that every single person has to make their own choice. So the first thing that I notice about this parable is the, the free will aspect to it. Now let's look at the various types of ground, talk a little bit about them, and talk about how do we deal with people that we think might be that ground. The first ground, the hard path. These are people, you know, we could say, you know, there's little hard heads. These are the people that don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. In fact, to be honest with you, probably most people like this are not here today. Now, you might be here because, well, I really don't want to come to church today, but because it's a holiday and my family said, you know, you've got to come to church with me. We're going to church. You might be here and you might be thinking, you know, well, I, I really don't have to listen. You might be the hard path. A lot of academics are the hard path. They've got it all figured out. They don't need to hear about Jesus Christ. They don't need to hear about God. They've got logic. They've got knowledge. They've got understanding. And faith, oh, that, that's supernatural stuff. That's really difficult for them. They can't always figure it out because they don't need to. Knowledge is fine for them. Folks, the way that we deal with people that are there, and, and by the way, this is where a lot of times kids come when they leave home and go to college. They go to college, and all of a sudden the knowledge comes, and it's like, where does God fit in with this? They've got to figure it out. They don't need to hear about Jesus Christ. The place that we can help people that struggle with that is by sharing love with them. In fact, that's really about the only way that we can change them. Let me give you an illustration of that. In Chicago, there's a guy by the name of Lee Strobel. Lee and his wife were married. They grew up in Chicago. Lee was a, uh, the reporter for the judicial system uh, for the Chicago Tribune. In other words, he, he did all the legal uh, responses. He wrote uh, the news. He was a reporter. He and his wife were at the point where Lee Strobel didn't need God. He was a very educated man. He was a logical man. He didn't need God. And he and his wife were married. They were doing fine. And Lee was a workaholic. He was working all the time. And his wife started becoming a part of a local church. And a bunch of women came alongside her, and they loved her, and she became a Christian. And Lee Strobel writes in his book, oh my goodness, I can't believe whenever I came home and found out that she was a Christian, oh my goodness, our, our marriage is going to be ruined. She's not going to be the fun-loving lady that she's always been. And she's going to be talking to me about what I need to do, that I need to go to God, and I really don't need God. But we, Lee Strobel found is as his wife loved him even more, even though he wasn't a Christian. She loved him to the point where he said, you know, I've got to research this Jesus Christ. If he's made this change in her life, and she still loves me, I need to look at this myself. And Lee Strobel decided that he had not really given the opportunity to understand, is Jesus truly who he says he is? So he wrote a book called The Case for Christ, a journalist's personal investigation of the evidence for Christ. He went through a process of determining, is Jesus truly who he says he is? And even though he was, had been the hard ground, he became a Christian. And I want to tell you, he became a Christian not just 30 or 60 or 100, but he's impacted thousands, probably millions. You might be here and you might be the hard ground. If you're the hard ground, open yourself up. Is Jesus truly who he says he is? Maybe you've got neighbors and friends who are that hard ground. 
share love and the word of God with them in that way. The second ground is the rocky ground. Those are sort of almost at the other end of the spectrum. Those are the people that are ruled by emotions. Those are the people that are looking for the newest thing to make them happy, to give them fulfillment. By the way, both of these, all of these, there are a lot of people in our society like this. These are the people that actually many times churches sort of reach because of the consumerism as, aspect of it. Let, let me tell you, this church is a wonderful church. Everybody should want to be a part of this church. And it's easy to come to this church and say, ah, oh, I leave on Sundays feeling so good about myself. And then whenever some struggles come, it's like, well, wait a second. Church didn't do everything for me. Our consumerism mentality feeds people to become like this. And when times become tough, all of a sudden it's like, well, God didn't take care of that for me. Church didn't take care of that for me. That's where the impact people that are the rocky ground teach them to serve. One of the things I love about this church is that this church serves people and gives all kinds of opportunities to serve. You've got opportunities. Craig told you the angel tree. He told you if you want to come, if you don't, didn't take an angel for the angel tree, come and help serve them as they're putting this stuff together. There are many ways that God has called you to serve that this church gives you the opportunity to do it. So if you're the rocky ground, maybe that's what you need to do. The third ground, soil with thorns. So what in the world are the thorns of life? Well, you know, Jesus describes those thorns in three different ways. By the way, he gives this parable in three different Gospels. He gives it Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So here's what Jesus says the thorns are in the various scriptures. Of course, Matthew, he says, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. In Mark, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. In Luke, Life's worries, riches, and pleasures. Wait a second. He's saying the thorns of life are the pursuit of wealth? The deceitfulness of wealth? This is where people like, and to be honest, there's a lot of people like this in our society. It's like, ah, the church doesn't make me wealthy. The church doesn't take care of all my needs. The church is not there for me, so I've got all these other things that are after me, so I don't really need the church. I don't need God in my life. I'm self-sufficient, and I'm pursuing all of these things myself. I don't need God to help me with it. I'm not going to be part of that. A lot of people in our society like that. God's not an add-on. God should be the central place in everything we do. And then, of course, we've got the fourth ground, the good soil. The good soil that makes a difference. So this morning, the, the, the place that I want to come, which ground are you? Like I said, every single person in this church, every single person out there, every single person fits into one of these four grounds. Are you, you know, are, are, do you have it all figured out? Do you think you know everything? Are you the person that's, you hear your consumer, Christian? Are you a person that, you know, well, I'm, I come to church, but boy, my job's so much more important. Oh, man, I, the other things in my life are so much more important. Are you the good ground? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you responding? Hopefully, you're the good ground. I'll tell you, we as pastors get a chance to work with a lot of good ground, and you are good ground here at this church. But that brings us to reflection number four, and this is really the place that I want to sort of end with in the scripture this morning. If you are a Christian, you have the seed of the word of God, and we're hoping that all of you are good ground. If you're good ground, God has given you his word. And the bottom line is, what are you going to do about it? There's a whole society that needs God's word. And I'm talking about this, but I'm also talking about your testimony. I'm talking about sharing your life with others. I'm talking about praying for people. 
I'm talking about living your life that reflects God and Jesus Christ. Every single person needs the Word of God. You're the place that they're going to find it. A lot of people don't, they don't come in these doors. A lot of people, they don't, they don't have a Bible. You are the means for the Word of God. And let me tell you, Craig and I and Derek, we get to talk to people who are good ground. You're going to be dealing with people around you, and some of them are not the good ground. You're the ones that actually need praise, and you're the ones that need to say, God bless you for sharing that with people who are not very nice. God bless you for sharing it with your neighbors and coworkers and people that desperately need Jesus Christ. It's tough work to do, to share it. But one of the great aspects is people that are in those other three grounds, when they change, and the Word of God changes them, they become some of the best ground there is. I think about Lee Strobel. So, two places today. Number one, which ground are you? And you might be thinking, oh, I'm absolutely, I'm a good ground. Ask your spouse today. <laughs> I mean, you might be. No, I'm not here to say you're not. But ask your spouse today. Say, do I fit into that good ground place? And number two, what are you doing with the seed of the word of God that God has given you? Who do you need to share it with? Let's pray. Worship team can come while I'm praying. Father God, I thank you for this church. For this church, how it shares the word of God for, with Salina and beyond. I thank you for the good ground that's here and for how that good ground is expanding. Father God, I pray for the people who are going to share the word of God with others. Even this week, especially at Christmas time, when people are more open to it than any other time of the year. Help them to share that. But then also help each person to reflect in their own life to say, where do I fit in? Which ground am I? And what do I need to do about it? Amen.